rather than uphold First Nations rights. You'll note that the bill requires the laws of Canada to align with the rights and standards of the Declaration. This, along with a statutory commitment to an action plan that's developed with Indigenous peoples, will help spark and sustain the transformative change that is urgently needed. I respect that all senators take the responsibilities to review this bill very seriously. However, you cannot lose sight of the closing parliamentary window. We must not lose another opportunity for such crucial legislation to be passed into law. This bill has been before First Nations in Parliament for some time. First Nations across Canada examined Bill C-262 in our assemblies and strongly supported its passage. Bill C-262 was before Parliament for three years, only to die on the order paper without ever coming to a final vote in this chamber. But after this setback, the AFN Chiefs and Assembly adopted a formal resolution mandating and tasking the AFN with the responsibility to work toward the earliest possible introduction of government legislation to implement the UN Declaration. Legislation that would be consistent with the requirements of the UN Declaration. It would need to be at least as strong as Bill C-262, which is the floor, but not the ceiling. And I say it's time to move forward. Bill C-15 establishes a requirement to implement the UN Declaration through law reform, and through the creation of an implementation plan. Bill C-15 does not diminish or take away rights from Indigenous peoples. It sets out a proactive and cooperative process to advance implementation of fundamental human rights. So at this point, the most crucial step is to pass Bill C-15 into law so that this work can finally proceed. And I know that some of you may have concerns about the UN Declaration's provisions on free, prior, and informed consent, but let me say this. Free prior and informed consent is not new, and it is not unique to the UN Declaration. Free prior and informed consent is a foundational aspect of our treaty relationship. It is something that First Nations exercise each time we enter into agreements with other governments, with public institutions, and with private corporations. But unfortunately, some have tried to use FPIC requirements as an excuse to encourage more delay in the implementation of Bill C-15 in Canada. We're told that FPIC needs to be studied more. We're told that it creates uncertainty for industry and unrealistic expectations for First Nations involving rights in title. The involving of rights in title holders in decision-making processes with government and industry creates economic certainty and stability. Free prior informed consent is an essential aspect of our right to self-determination, a right that is already recognized in Canadian law. Now, our First Nations are many and diverse. And naturally, we don't always agree on everything. But there is one thing on which there has always been complete agreement. Respect for our inherent right to self-determination is the necessary foundation for any engagement with other governments or industry. I encourage the Senate to seize this opportunity and remind the members of the committee that if this chamber had brought 2626, C-262 to a vote in 2019, the work on law reform and a national action plan would already be well underway cannot wait under any longer. So the Senate has a choice to shape where we will be two years from now. Will we still be spinning our wheels? Or will our first national implementation plan be within sight? I urge you all to seize this historic opportunity and to play a key role in upholding and advancing the human rights of Indigenous peoples. Thank you all. Thank you, National Chief. And I'd like to invite Nathan Obed, the President of ITK. Akumik, Mr. Chair, I um, want to recognize all the senators here today and also my fellow national Indigenous leaders. It's uh, good to be before you again today on this very important topic. Inuit Tupperik Katmi represents uh, the 65,000 Inuit uh, that um, are represented through modern land claim agreements with um, the Nunatsivut Inuit. Nunavik Inuit, Nunavut Inuit, and Inuvialuit Inuit, and their respective modern treaties or land claim agreements. Uh, ITK passed a resolution recently supporting the, um, the passage of Bill C-15, but also had um, said that 
it could be improved even further through the addition of an Indigenous Human Rights Commission. And we put forward that um, requested amendment to the House of Commons Standing Committee. And uh, it is also, I believe, within your package here today. It is meant to enhance the legislation. And also, it just uh, answers the very basic question of how uh, are we going to enforce this legislation once it's passed? In the text, we have uh, in the action plan uh, considerations for recourse and remedy. So uh, there are already considerations in the proposed text without the amendment about something like this Indigenous Human Rights uh, Commission. Basically, this legislation closes legislative and policy gaps that contribute to human rights violations against Inuit, as well as it will prevent discrimination and provide recourse and remedy for human rights violations experienced by not only Inuit, but First Nations and Métis in Canada. We have worked positively and constructively with the federal government on the development of Bill C-15 within a relatively short time frame. Uh, I want to uh, thank the Department of Justice and the Minister of Justice for ensuring that co-development happened within this particular piece of legislation, and also uh, for the government's willingness to be flexible and consider amendments uh, throughout uh, the process. For some time, we have wondered where Indigenous people stand within this country when it comes to reconciliation. Uh, the words are um, very strong sometimes, from the federal government or from provinces or territories. This is a practical example of how we can move uh, from the rhetoric of reconciliation to the unfinished business of upholding Indigenous peoples' human rights in this country and complying with uh, international law. It is not an easy process, uh, but it is one that is necessary for us to uh, ensure that the human rights of all Canadians are upheld in this country. So I will uh, come back to my initial statement that this particular piece of legislation and Canada's endorsement of UNDRIP in an international context closes a human rights gap that exists in this country for the protection of First Nations, Indian, Métis, and all Indigenous peoples' rights within this country. Uh, we see this piece of uh, federal legislation as a positive contribution to um, uh, the approach of human rights uh, being applied equally to all Canadian citizens. Nakumik. Thank you, President Mikaudet. Now I'd like to invite David Chartron, Vice President of MNC. Sorry for that, Mr. Chairman. Technology. Uh, I hope you hear me loud and clear now. Uh, yes. Let me start off by uh, first acknowledging uh, your committee, but definitely I want to acknowledge my colleagues, uh, the leaders of the First Nation Inuit, of course, Barry Belgard, whose uh, really recognition will last for many, many more years to come. He's not running in politics again, but he's definitely made change in this country, which I think we need to all appreciate. And also to uh, my friend Natan, uh, who continues to fight for the afternoon. But now, I've sent a brief uh, uh, that I was going to read and I changed my mind. And because mostly what I'm going to say is repetitive with uh, Barry and, uh, and uh, Natan have said. But let me say this. What are we really facing here today? Uh, what we need to talk about? And I don't know how many of you actually know who the Métis Nation is. I'm not sure. I'm not going to second guess you. I know Patty knows who we are. But the Métis Nation actually is a Western-based people. What you see before me is beads that reflect the story of my people. And if you want to know the Métis Nation in its history, we were once called the flower bead people. There's about 400,000 of us in Western Canada. So this declaration impacts 400,000 Métis citizens in the prairies. And it tells you the story of who we are, but that these are can only be found in the prairies. 
In the prairies, I can tell you who is wearing Ojibwe beading, Sioux beading, prairie, the, the, the uh, Plains Creed, the Northern Creed, just by the beadwork that they wear. That's how we knew each other as a people. Times are slowly changing this country. And your institution is the place of second thought. The place that actually looks at it again one more time before Parliament makes a decision, no matter which political party sits there. And I watched a movie the other day, and I think I, I want to speak on this for all those to reflect what we're feeling right now in our homeland about this particular declaration, which we support 100%. Our, our consul consultations was ratified by our people. They support this UN declaration wholeheartedly. I was watching a movie on Ruth Ginsburg, and when she actually went and pursued her uh, legal career, where women really were not accepted in Harvard, and uh, she challenged the issue, and she did extremely well. She had to leave Harvard and go to Columbia. And she did something great, great that impacted not only North America, but the world. She looked at the legislation of discrimination that was taking place against women, and she decided to take them on. And she fought one legislation at a time. And she began to change the mindset of the way things are, were typically run, the way the mindset of how things were done in the past and how they tried to maintain the way of the past. Times are changing. The law is changing with us. We're going into a different spectrum of where Indigenous people fit in society and where Métis people and First Nation Inuit fit in Confederation. That includes the econ economies, natural resources, the environment, all of these aspects. So when you look at what was achieved by one lady, became a Supreme Court judge later, but it was changing the mindset of the way we think. It was telling us it was time for change. And this United Declaration is telling Canada, it's time for you to do the right thing. It's time for you to make that change. Because if we are not the leaders as we say we are in the, in the world, not just in North America, in the world, and if we're gonna be playing second fiddle or third fiddle, to somebody else to beat us ahead, to put legislation on something as, as, as vital as recognizing the founders, the inhabitants of, of the indigenous people. First Nation go back 10,000 years or more in this country. We go back maybe 400 years. Us. Anyway, go back thousands of years. This is our land. We've been left out, we've been pushed out, and we fought our way through the courts to find our place in, in a parity situation. We're getting there slowly. But this declaration changes the very foundation of how we go forward. How do we work with industry? How do we work with government? How do we truly become government to government, nation to nation? And how do we adopt that? So you're the place of second thought, the one that's supposed to put the solid footing of where we should be as a country and the diversity of how we think. So I'm asking you on behalf of the Métis Nation, help us get there, fight for it. As Chief Delgard said, this is our third chance. We cannot miss this opportunity. We need to get this into a royal ascent. We, know, we need to show the world what Canada is. That's a place that everybody should dream to come to. All minorities from all over the world should want to come to a place of fairness, equality, and the benefit of, of, of people with parity. One woman changed that in the United States, and I'm sure we, with the amount of people that are in our politics today, the amount of people in our parliament as elected officials, the people appointed in, in the Senate today, if everybody said it's time for Indigenous people to be treated with some dignity and some respect and some fairness and equality, it should pass quite easily. Industry has been used to be a threat. It's not a threat. I work with Enbridge. I work with the president. Every two months, he and I have a chat. We have a solid relationship, respecting each other, and we worked together as partners. And we've done that with nearly every industry that we sat with. So when people try to fear monger that if this thing is passed, we will kill economies, we'll kill jobs, we'll kill the industry, it is so wrong, completely wrong, completely false. In fact, it's the opposite. All of you know, if a mine is going to be built, it's not built in a day, it's not built in a year, it's probably a decade or more of investment and planning. So there's so much time to get together. This will be in parity with Section 35 of the Constitution. It'll help achieve duty to consult in this country. It'll get us there faster. And everybody and stakeholders, investors will know they can trust that relationship. Night 10 seconds are up, Mr. Chairman. I want to tell you, thank you for allowing me to speak. And But let's ask for change. And you could make that change. All we need is you to support it. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Mr. Chartrand. I'd like to open the floor for questions. Uh, the first question will go to the sponsor of the bill, Senator Labrakane Benson, followed by the critic of the bill, uh, Senator Dennis Patterson. Uh, Senator Labrakane Benson. Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, I just want to thank all of our esteemed leaders for being here today and um, for meeting with, with me earlier on this bill. Um, I wonder if I could ask a question of Mr. Pell LaFond. Um, you know, I'm looking at a document from Treaty 6, 7, and 8, the Association of uh, Treaties, Treaty Chiefs in Alberta, and it was on March 16th. And there were two resolutions that I would really hope that you could clarify uh, for us. Number 10, that the Bill C-15 would ensure that Canada has territorial integrity over our territories, despite our treaties. And number 15, or 13, that says Bill C-15 would be evidence of Canada's ownership over territories and resources. Do you think you could clarify those for us? Thank you, Senator. Um, appreciate that question. Yeah, I'm familiar with those resolutions and some of the other resolutions passed by various First Nations organizations. Um, I do think that one of the reasons why this bill, C-15, is important is because we are dealing with a very significant time where work is happening within First Nations and that work needs to be aided by the implementation of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. I don't view this bill as a bill that um, strips away the rights of Indigenous people. I view it as a bill that affirms the rights, but there are debates inside First Nations in particular, in particular about the proper role of who represents whom, the continuing role of the Indian Act and the significant uh, significance of strengthening the position of Treaty First Nations. Um, I think Bill C-15 will help us sort through those issues. Um, I certainly wouldn't state a conclusion as bold as those conclusions. Um, I think that the issue, as we saw recently in the Supreme Court of Canada decision in Desitil, where the Supreme Court has said, we need to reconcile the pre-existing sovereignty and rights of Indigenous people and First Nations in particular, and the sacred nature of those treaties with our current situation of colonial laws. And the declaration assists in that project. So I think that um, the concerns that have been brought forward by various areas, treaty leaders are entitled to voice their opinions and they will. Um, I do feel that the legal conclusions in those resolutions um, are not supported by law. And I do think Bill C-15 will provide a forum to actually sort some of those issues out properly in terms of the relationship between the Crown and First Nations. Thank you very much. Uh, Senator Patterson, followed by Senator Horay Nising and Senator Coyle. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good afternoon, colleagues and national leaders. Uh, Mr. Obed, uh, in your brief to the Commons Committee, you described the need for Indigenous rights to be enforceable. However, and you also said uh, just now that uh, you see this legislation as closing legislation, legislative and policy gaps with respect to human rights. However, the ministers and officials have repeatedly stated that FPIC is contextual that UNDRIP will continue to be used as an interpretive tool as it already is being used and does not, quote, uh, he said this morning, does not replace the government's decision-making authority. And he referred to uh, the, um, that being uh, the, the last word. Is it your understanding that this bill accomplishes more than establishing an action plan for potential future legislation, legislative and or policy changes? And do you feel comfortable that there is no deadline for making such, such changes and implementing them after the completion of the action plan? Thank you. Thank you, Senator. I'll try my best to answer the first question, but I might need a little bit more help in understanding your second question. Um, in the legislation, there's also the expressed uh, um, uh, need to harmonize and intent to harmonize Canadian legislation consistent with the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And that uh, exercise over time 
and will not only happen through the creation of a specific action plan, but it, it will require a number of different uh, institutions to change in relation to uh, the particular uh, harmonization uh, that, that we will have to go through. In the end, the, uh, the United Nations Declaration is a, uh, an articulation of existing rights. Uh, they're not new rights, and therefore the application of any uh, particular provision within uh, the United Nations Declaration should be seen within that particular context. So, uh, if you take free prior to informed consent and you apply that concept to modern treaties or, or uh, land claim agreements that Inuit have signed with the Crown, we now see uh, or other arrangements based on the provisions of those land claim agreements that uh, are in keeping with free prior to informed consent. So uh, there are pathways forward on this particular issue, and there are already um, Indigenous peoples who are who have worked with government for these constructive arrangements to ensure that that free prior to informed consent is utilized. Uh, as for your second question in regards to timing, uh, please uh, clarify. Well, there is no deadline for making uh, for implementing the action plan. Does that do you have concerns about that? I believe that every iteration of the action plan and the it will be an evergreen process. Also, the reporting to Parliament is um, an annual process. So, uh, in relation to what is described in the Act and uh, the goodwill that we expect from the Government of Canada, uh, I am confident that we will be able to work constructively through those particular mechanisms. I'm not sure if I have it. Thank you. And I'm not sure if I have any time, Mr. Chair. Uh, barely. Um, about Mr. Lametti's statement that um, with regard to Canadian federal and provincial jurisprudence, they continue to be the last word in a number of different contexts. I'm sorry, uh, Senator Patterson. Would, I missed my mark here, so uh, time is up. Uh, Senator Horay Nisi, followed by Senator Coyle and Senator Francis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I will ask uh, uh, this first question of uh, National Chief Belgard, um, but I will invite, if, if time allows, uh, the others to um, contribute. And I thank you all for being here and for uh, your own valuable contribution to uh, our consideration of this bill. Um, National Chief Belgard, um, you mentioned in your opening comment that the uh, previous version of this bill, uh, C-262, was uh, essentially the, the um, base, not the ceiling. And um, I'm interested in hearing from you specifically uh, with respect to your level of satisfaction uh, with the current form of the bill with its amendments um, and whether there are any other amendments, as you mentioned, they were those that you were advocating for were not all um, incorporated uh, in the final version. Are there any of those outstanding uh, concerns that uh, caused you to hesitate uh, with respect to uh, the current form of the bill? Well, thank you, Senator, for that question. And uh, again, as I indicated in my, uh, my presentation earlier, I'm not seeking any further amendments. The, the, the window is too tight, the window is closing, and uh, I don't want to see any further amendments, and I would encourage the Senate as well not to seek amendments. Uh, we, we put 12 recommendations forward, eight of them were, were agreed to in the, at the Senate committee, and, and we're pleased with that. Strengthening, uh, you know, stronger word of racism was included in the document. Um, uh, references to the doctrine of discovery and the doctrine of uh, terra nullius, you know, two very racist uh, illegal doctrines. Uh, globally, um, you know, we wanted to, uh, a few uh, stronger pieces. The uh, plural on, on four, changing purpose to purposes, uh, requesting the word framework instead of implementation. Um, 
the, the, the time frame from three years to two years. And uh, so we, we've, we've made the, uh, some movement in terms of the, um, the pieces we wanted to see addressed. And so again, uh, just in light of the time, June is fast approaching. There's not a lot of sitting days. Um, we just need to see Royal Assent passed and down the road, further amendment can always come back to legislation down the road once it's passed. And, and the fear is if this does not pass this time, this may not come back for four or five years with the federal government election coming. You never know when it'll come back. So uh, that's why we're saying no amendments, urge the Senate to pass this as soon as possible. Thank you. I'd love to hear from uh, the other um, national representatives. Okay, if you don't mind, if you don't. Oh, Mr. Chartra, yeah, thank you. Uh, again, I, I concur with uh, what uh, Chief Delgar stated. Uh, we don't want no amendments. We don't want no pauses. We don't want no hesitation. We want this to pass. It's, it's our third chance at it. Uh, we don't know what the future will give us. And that's why I gave my presentation about how change can be made by one person and what it's done for the rest of North America and definitely the world. Thank so you. for my... Mr. Oh, Mr. wow. Chartron, time okay. is up. <laughs> okay, you got to give us a... Mr. Chairman, if you can raise up your hand five seconds or something so I can see you. Thank you. Yeah, very much. I, I did 10. And then oh, five. I didn't see you. I, I didn't know. see you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, Senator Coyle, followed by Senator Francis, and then uh, Senator Stuart Olson. Uh, Senator Coyle. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to all of our guests for being with us and for all of your hard work in helping to shape Bill C-15. Welcome back to the Senate Aboriginal Peoples Committee. As you're aware, this committee passed Bill C-262 two years ago. My question is for Mr. Obed. I understand that you support Bill C-15. Could you please elaborate on ways the proposed Indigenous Human Rights Commission would contribute to the implementation of UNDRIP in Canada. Could you also uh, let us know about whether you have support from other Indigenous leaders for this and what the reaction has been from government? Thank you. Thanks for your question, Senator. Uh, ITK has been clear about uh, its position on not only passing domestic legislation in regards to UNDRIP since 2017, but also uh, has been in, has introduced and has continued to uh, push as a as a clear position the creation of an indigenous human rights commission consistent with the UN Paris principles as the most effective means for providing recourse and remedy to indigenous peoples whose rights have been violated. Uh, we've talked about this as such an integral part of uh, federal legislation being more than symbolic. Somehow, uh, uh, if human rights have been violated in this country, uh, Indigenous peoples have not had access uh, to many processes that have understood uh, Indigenous peoples' rights or the, uh, the necessary consideration or have considered the necessary considerations for uh, a fair um, processing and decision-making around those particular violations. Uh, we don't have to look very far. Uh, the residential school era provides us plenty of context on how human rights commissions can exist in this country, but uh, Indigenous people's human rights are not necessarily upheld within that particular federal, provincial, and territorial legislative policy context. We have talked uh, with uh, First Nations and Métis leaders. Uh, as you heard from uh, Chief Elgard, uh, you know, there's, there's been uh, some consideration for this, but also um, uh, an understanding that, that in the future, uh, this might be something that, uh, that could be seriously pursued. We, we support, Inuit Tapri Kanatomi supports Bill C-15, but we were trying to help the federal government do its job <laughs> and to follow through with its intent into specific, cohesive, and practical implementation measures. So um, we 
we have tried to build this particular amendment so that it fits within the Canadian context of um, Time, how, human, Quebec, uh, how human rights commissions function. Uh, Senator Francis, followed by Senator Stuart Olsing and Senator McDonald. Senator Francis. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just for clarity, Mr. Ovid, uh, I'm not sure if I heard your answer before, but could you please confirm that ITK would support the passage of this bill without amendments? And also, in addition, I'd like all three leaders to briefly speak about the degree of support from First Nation, Inuit, and Métis rights holders that you represent uh, for this bill. Having been a chief for nearly two decades, I can appreciate that unanimity is not always possible. However, there is a broad consensus that the bill uh, the passage of this bill would have a gradual but positive impact on the survival, dignity, and well-being of your rights holders across Canada. And this is certainly critical to national reconcilia reconciliation efforts. Thank you for the question. Inuit Tepri Kanatomi uh, does support the passage of C-15 without amendment, but uh, we do hope that everyone uh, would feel that it is in the best interest of this particular piece of legislation to have the proper chance of success. And with our proposed amendments, we feel that that uh, is possible. Just, just quickly as well, uh, Senator, for First Nations, we have 634. We have over 60 plus different nations or tribes by languages. And uh, you don't always get unanimity, as you said, uh, but by the vast majority do support it. Uh, you have uh, the 203 First Nations in British Columbia, for example. There is provincial legislation now implementing uh, UN declaration there at that level. And there is support right across Canada for this. And as I indicated earlier on, the chief said, go and get a government bill. That's as strong as our 262 and build upon that. And that's the only mandate we were given. That's what C-15 represents. And it's uh, contained in the recommendations as well in the TRC Commission to implement UN Declaration, as well as the Missing, Murdered, Indigenous Women and Girls recommendations. So uh, there is support for it. But I also recognize there are some that, that don't agree with it as well. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Mr. Charton. Yeah, thank you for the question, uh, uh, Senator uh, Francis. Uh, clearly, without uh, hesitation, we have one of the most democratic systems in our, in our Métis government that we've been practicing for hundreds of years. It's the same model we practice today. And uh, in our consultations and uh, feedback from our citizens, without doubt, there's a clear majority from our leaders right across the homeland. And it's not a perfect document, we know that, uh, but we clearly know that the difference it'll make not only for ourselves, but for the country as a whole, will be only a, a win-win for everyone. So uh, we will accept it as is, and we definitely have a clear majority of our people. And as Perry said, as uh, Natana said, they will all be a dissenter, uh, but that's what we have democracies for and governments for. So. So from our perspective, we're very clear that we support Bill C-15. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator Stewart Olson, followed by Senator McDonald and Senator Pace. Senator Stewart Olson. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, just to, I'd like to thank you all uh, who spoke because you certainly gave a clear presentation of your uh, thoughts on the bill than we've had today from uh, the ministers and the bureaucrats. I want to just uh, bring up with you one thing that was said uh, when officials briefed uh, the official opposition on the bill, they specifically were asked about the action plan which the bill mandates. And the official said, in the final analysis, there's no federal intent to seek consent before finalizing the action plan. Today, the, we re-asked the um, officials and who kind of were a bit less informative, but did not comment yay or nay on, on what, we, what we had asked. And as a matter of fact, when Senator Patterson asked a question and quoted the same official minister, Lametti asked him, what do you mean by consent? So we don't have the same understanding and the same uh, confidence as you all do that this is actually going to happen. Have you actually been told that the Fed, what the federal view is and do you agree with that interpretation and approach? Uh, from all three, if you like, or uh, perhaps uh, Chief Belgard would uh, would go first. Well, thank you, Senator. Again, um, we have a couple of bills that are already have been uh, done through co-development. C91, the language bill, revitalization bill of that, and C92, child welfare. 
and uh, the national action plans will be jointly developed. And so once that's there in legislation, that's the key. It's, 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 it's legislated. You have to jointly work on this with the rights and title holders. So that's all I can say. So you can, we have to hold them to that. Right now, there's nothing yeah, putting to do. the government's head. Once you have this legislation passed, we have another arrow in our quiver to shoot if need be. So I'll keep it short because I want my other colleagues to, to, yeah. to present as well. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chartra. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Thank you. Uh, Stewart. Uh, clearly, from from our position, uh, uh, whether the bureaucrats say there's no guarantees of consent to be achieved before uh, moving forward on initiatives in this country, I think what people are missing here is that when you have this uh, free and informed consent uh, process and this United Declaration, it's actually set the framework for a real discussion to take place with those that are going to be affected on either side. So it gives you the opportunity now to, fit, to get rid of all of these unknowns, because what really challenges Indigenous people today, especially when you come into our territory and our lands, is that it's imposed on us overnight. You're going to, I'm opening a dam, I'm opening a mine, I'm taking over the forest, all these hectares are mine now. So it, it's never where all this discussion is pre-happening for at least a decade, because it should take a decade to make massive plans on the effects you're having. What are the future nuclear sites they're talking about in the prairies? So when you look at this concept, I think this consultation will have no choice. Consent is oh, something. Oh. Oh, oh, Can we just get the last, uh, sure. Mr. Sorry. Obed, please? Thanks for the question. Uh, the... I'm sorry, Sandra Olson, time is up. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you all for that. Uh, Sandra McDonald by Sandra Pate and then Sandra Hartlink. Sandra McDonald. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my question is for the Assembly of First Nations. There has been considerable concern raised about the consultation process by witnesses in the other place, such as the Congress of Aboriginal Peoples, the Confederacy of the Six Nations, and the File Hills Capel Tribal Council, and others. The action plan development process, as we were told today, promises to be much more complex and involved. Because there is currently no agreement on basic terms like the definition of consent, and since there's a need to look at multiple definitions considering the government's claim that consent is contextual, I would like to ask, there are over 630 band, band councils, over 60 traditional nations, all of the Métis people, four Inuit land claim organizations, as well as, as numerous women's grassroots and youth organizations, are you not raising impossible expectations in supporting a two-year time frame to complete the action plan? With great respect, Senator, I'll say no. Um, I believe uh, the two-year action plan can, once there's political will, and if this is legislation, when Bill C-15 passes, it's legislated. And, and the only two things that I tell to, to people that, that the positive thing is the law and policy review within C-15. And, and that's very powerful. So the comprehensive claims policy has to be updated, specific claims policy, additions to reserve, the inherent right to sell government policy, and the Indian Act, which has still been here since 1876. <clears throat> All those things will need to get fixed and, uh, and brought in line with the UN Declaration. So for us, uh, this will have, like I said before, another arrow in our quiver that we can utilize to get these things fixed properly now. And no more denial of rights, title, and jurisdiction, but actual apl application and implementation and enforcement of it. And on the duty consultant accommodate, I want to ask a quick response from our legal counsel, Mary Ellen Trella Font, if, if that will help clarify it as well, Senator. But that's my talk on that. My thoughts on that, we can get this done. Um, yes, thank you. If I can, um, the concerns about how does the government go about engaging with the Indigenous people on an action plan? There's no question there is complexity and there is diversity, but they are engaging now. Um, and the importance of Bill C-15 is a shift. And I can say from working on this matter in British Columbia, where the development of an action plan has been underway, um, that the two-year time frame is a reasonable time frame, but it does require government to shift how it does business, working with First Nations, Métis, and Inuit. But how things have been done in the past, as National Chief Bellegarde said, the unilateral dictation of policies frequently that are then thrown out by the Supreme Court because they weren't done properly. This gives us a chance to do things better together, co-develop and work respectfully. So it's not about transactions, it's about relations. 
Uh, I had a supplementary question, but I guess we're out of time. You can put me on the second question. Thank you, Mr. Senator Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator Pate, followed by Senator Hartling, followed by Senator Anderson. Senator Pate. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you to all of our leaders for being here. Um, critics have expressed concerns surrounding subjecting the UN Declaration to the Constitution, um, while and um, while recognizing Aboriginal treaty rights, and concern that this would place stringent limitations on them. You've spoken, uh, and I'm speaking in particular, um, Chief Belgard. You've spoken positively of Section 35, stating that it includes the inherent right to self-determination and self-government. Um, how can language in Bill C-15 and the upcoming National Action Plan add clarity to the UN Declaration and Section 35 as separate legal processes, one? And um, for example, how can the National Action Plan respond to issues surrounding the implications, for instance, of Sparrow on the UN Declaration article implementation to ensure unfettered self-determination? And if others want to comment as well, I'd be happy to. Just quickly, it uh, doesn't subject it, Senator. Uh, the Ducatel case is the answer when you look at the Ducatel case. Um, and so it's important, again, Section 35, we've always said, is a full box of rights, which includes inherent right to self-government self-determination. We don't want to rely on the courts for another 25, 30 years because we always win anyway through the Supreme Court process to fill that box up. I'm going to ask Mary Ellen Trapelafon, she's the constitutional lawyer and expert on this, to help us provide some clarity on your very good questions. Uh, I would say I'm a Bush lawyer, um, but at the same time, she's the constitutional lawyer uh, so I'm going to ask her to make some quick questions, or thank quick you. answers. Yes, um, thank you. I would just say that um, the idea that Bill C-15 in any way takes the United Nations Declaration and makes it subject to a bad decision sometime 30 years ago or something, that's just an, er an error in um, how the law works. And Section 35 is a constitutionally protected uh, provision, as this committee knows, and as the senator is aware, and the um, jurisprudence on Section 35, including, as National Chief said, the recent important decision in the Desitel case, states again that one of the purposes in Section 35 is to address the fact that Indigenous people and First Nations, in particular, were here since time immemorial, and their rights have been protected, and the current First Nations are the successor holders of those rights, and we need to reconcile that. So the UN Declaration provides a tool to create a positive recognition-based space to talk about who are Indigenous governments. It's not about the Indian Act being imposed by the federal government. It's about Indigenous people and First Nations selecting our governments and our leaders and engaging properly with uh, the government of Canada. So the idea that somehow this bill subjugates an international instrument to uh, some kind of decision is just, it's, it's an error. Uh, Section 35 is there, it's it's moving, it's flexible, and we've seen that in the recent Desitil decision from the court. Thank you. Would anybody else like to comment? Oh, uh, we're sorry, out of time? Senator yep, so that's fine. Thank you. Uh, Senator Hartling, then Senator Anderson, and then Senator Tannis. Senator Hartling. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you very much for presenting today. I really appreciate your great presentations. And um, I also thank you, Mr. Chartan, for mentioning my favorite person, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. That was a great example. So my question is, um, how do you think Bill C-15 practically and positively can uh, affect Canadians? And perhaps how can it change the future direction in Canada? If we think that it goes through and, and then what, what next? What do you see as the future implications of this? Anybody who would like to answer, please. Don, you want to go first? And it's on there. It's yeah. Great, thank, thank you to my colleagues and thank you to the Senator for the question. Uh, you know, this particular piece of legislation is very general and it is it, it has a number of key points that are essential to reconciliation and acknowledgements with, especially within the preamble about the context in which we go about doing this work and some of the, the, the realities of, of um, the relationship between First Nations, Inuit, and Métis, and Canada as, as a nation state. It attempts to harness the, the, um, the, the declaration and its 
intent within a UN context domestically. So um, ensuring that the laws of Canada are consistent with the declaration, uh, creating an action plan that thinks about the 40 plus provisions within UNDRIP and how to um, move this country into a space where we are recognizing and implementing the existing rights of Indigenous peoples of this country. It'll take some time, but I think the groundwork is there and with goodwill, this could be transformative. Although the, it is, the transformative nature of it isn't necessarily in the specifics of each provision, it is in the overall scope of work. Thank you. Just very quickly as well, Senator, it's a TRC called it the framework for reconciliation. As well, it will also help get rid of the systemic racism and discrimination, whether it be in the healthcare system, whether it be in the justice policing system, or even in the educational system. So it'll be a powerful tool once it's mm -hmm. once it's brought into Royal Assent Bill C-15. It's a powerful tool to help build a better Canada for us all. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Senator, for that question. And thank you for, uh, I think we have the same uh, passion of seeing heroes. Uh, and, and you look at uh, that example of what change took place. This is the same philosophy that's behind it. If you look at all the concepts that are built within this declaration, to deal with education, to deal with culture, to deal with all the var variables that are out there, it really sets the, in the key why I used Ginsburg this morning, was it changes the mind of how we think. It changes the country and the leaders of that country to think differently. And so thank you, Mr. Christmas. Uh, but again, at the end of the day, it's very clear. If we change the mindset, we can change the future and we can change a better, a better position for all of us. Thank, thank you. you. Um, Senator Anderson and then Senator Tanish. Ben, I do share. Akana, my question is for President Oled of ICK. I'd like to know, did the Inuit discuss this bill in terms of land claim agreements or modern treaties? And is this bill seen to complement and support or challenge in any way the existing agreements and modern treaties? And how do you see this bill working with existing land claim agreements and modern treaties or those that do not have signed modern treaties or are in the midst of the negotiation. The Inuit Tepri Kanatsumi Board of Directors discussed this in a, a board meeting last month and did pass a resolution supporting the passing of Bill C-15 at the conclusion of that particular conversation. Uh, the modern treaties or land claim agreements uh, only cover a specific scope. The UN declaration is universal in scope in relation to the very specific nature of land claim agreements. And so there was an opportunity that Inuit leaders see, um, especially in areas such as healthcare or education or culture and language, where the provisions in the UN declaration and then the adoption of the declaration domestically through this particular instrument uh, would allow for a, a, um, a better way in which to implement our existing rights in those areas that uh, above and beyond the way in which we've been able to articulate and implement our rights through modern treaties. In no way did uh, any land claim leader uh, bring up the possibility that the, this particular piece of federal legislation could do anything to lessen um, the um, the status of land claim agreements or the ability to implement these constitu constitutionally protected measures. Thank you. And uh, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, Senator Tanish. Thank you. Um, Two quick questions for uh, first for uh, Ms. Uh, Turpel Lapond, and then if Chief Belgard could answer the second one. Um, uh, uh, Minister Lametti was very clear on two things uh, around FPIC. Number one, it's not a veto. He said that specifically. Uh, Ms. Turpel Lapond, is that your understanding and your position as well? I'd like to get that on the record. And then secondly, for uh, for Chief Belgard, <clears throat> Mr. Lametti also uh, went on to say that uh, FPIC and in particular consent and also who provides consent so that we don't have the same uh, issues that we had with Wet'suwet'en uh, will be clarified in the two-year 
uh, uh, implementation period that that is one of the one of the projects that needs to be done in order to make sure that everything runs smoothly thereafter. Is that your understanding as well? Yes, thank you so much for that question. Um, the um, Article 19 on free prior and informed consent really just affirms what has already been recognized in the law in Canada in the Haida case, which is the consent of First Nations is needed, particularly when there are developments in the core territory of the nation. So it is context driven, but the obligations in Bill C-15 are on government. The idea that free prior, prior, prior and informed consent would be a veto, it is not a veto. Um, obviously, government has authority to do things. And, um, but if government trammels on the rights of Indigenous peoples, we certainly don't want that to happen. We need to get these things worked out properly for business and government. Um, but if there are violations, government is government. Government has broad powers, and those powers are not being stripped away by Bill C-15. But the principle is a very important one. On your second point, Senator, about who gives the consent, um, Indigenous governments must be given must give the consent, but the Indigenous governments must be the governments representing the rights and title holders. Right holders. And that will be very important to note because the when you mentioned Wet'suwet'en about a concern there, I think it's important to note that in the Wet'suwet'en matter, the hereditary and elected leaders have been working together and working with Canada and British Columbia on governance and such matters. It's just unwinding 140 years of colonial denial can be high conflict. And we need to adopt this bill so that we can have tools and approaches that are more affirmatory and that advance reconciliation so that the Crown has proper guidance from Bill C-15 so that engagement with Indigenous peoples would be respectful and based on the recognition of rights and recognition of who represents First Nations. And it's the freely chosen representatives of the First Nations, which will include in many instances the hereditary chiefs um, whose leadership was, of course, depressed for years by colonial Canadian laws. He's covered it. Thank you. Um, time is up. I wish to thank our panelists this afternoon, uh, President Barry, National Chief Perry Bellegarde and Dr. Mary Ellen Trapal from the AFN, President Nathan Obed and Tania Monaghan from the ITK, and Vice President David Chartron, Celeste McKay, and Brandon McLeod from the MNC. We will now suspend uh, the committee to allow our next panel uh, to be uh, set up. So uh, thank you very much. And five, four,